Okay, so today we're going to you know, continue our discussion of energy efficient computing. Uh, we, uh, at the end of the last lecture, we talked about heterogeneity, and we said that the motivation for heterogeneity is because you, know, you had uh, different kinds of, of program characteristics that could be exploited by uh, more specialized architectures, right? And, and the key one that we've been focusing on uh, so far is the idea of sort of data parallel. Uh, computation that can be exploited by uh, architectures like GPUs and, uh, and the, the key uh, capability you get is higher performance and much more importantly energy efficiency and we're going to kind of dig into energy uh, efficiency a little in a little more detail today and sort of talk about you know why this is such uh, a pressing concern in modern computing environments. Okay so hardware specialization and uh, Algorithm specific programming, uh, which you know would be kind of the next step beyond a uh, heterogeneous compute environment, would be one that's very specialized for a particular application, right? So, energy efficient computing, right? So, uh, we're constrained by energy today because uh, of the state of the underlying semiconductor technology, right? So, there was a time when, as you got uh, new uh, generations of processing technology, every generation gave you more transistors, but those transistors dissipated less power, right? And so you could get more performance for the same amount of power. This was called Denard scaling. So that ended about 10 years ago. So now, every time you increase the number of transistors, you dissipate more power. And now you're constrained, right? So we're in this power energy constrained environment and to kind of understand how this works, right? So uh, energy is power times time. Uh, so our amount of power we have is fixed. I don't know why this is going on its own. So we're at this point where uh, in order to increase performance, right, we have to decrease the, the uh, amount of energy per operation, right? So this is fundamentally where we are where if we want, given a fixed amount of power, we can dissipate. If we want more performance, then we have to improve our energy efficiency. And the key mechanism for increasing energy efficiency is to become more specialized, to get rid of the excess power we dissipate by doing things that don't uh, uh, focus on moving the, the computation forward. All right, so... Uh, so why are we energy constrained? It depend, you know, across the computing landscape, we, we, we've got energy constraints, right? So if you think about supercomputers, where you've got thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of cores in the data center, and you have to supply power and cooling uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, keep the, the whole system, all the systems running, and this, of course, has a huge energy cost, right? So you're constrained in large supercomputer environments. You're also constrained in data centers beyond, uh, behind the, the, the large uh, websites like uh, Google and Facebook. There, again, the cost of supplying the energy for uh, powering and cooling the, uh, the, the, the uh, computing uh, possibly you know, over time over the, say, say the three-year lifetime of, of the computing uh, resources uh, is more than the cost of actually acquiring the computation. Uh, when we talk about mobile devices, you're energy constrained because, of course, you have no fan in your mobile device because a fan would be uh, inconvenient. Uh, and so uh, you know, the, the d heat dissipation has to happen passively. And then, of course, you have a battery that uh, has to uh, provide the, the, the power, the energy uh, to the compute. And so there you're also energy constrained. So across the computing landscape, you're energy constrained. So this is the equation we were looking at. So energy, we said, is power times time, right? And we said power was fixed for uh, uh, semiconductor processing uh, uh, constraints. And so if we wanted to improve performance... Uh, then we have to become more energy efficient. And the way to do that is to do specialized functionality that reduces the overhead. And the question is sort of what is the magnitude of this improvement that you can get from specialization over a general purpose processing environment composed of CPUs? So let's dig into that, right? And so we, we've already looked at 
specializing uh, for data parallel uh, applications using GPUs uh, at, you know, at large scale. And you know, of course, uh, within the architecture of a GPU, we see SIMD processing, which is also exploiting uh, data parallelism. And so uh, the rules of thumb are that you can get a tremendous improvement. We'll come back to this. Uh, about sort of what, what improvement we, we can get. Uh, but uh, the question is, you know, we spent a lot of time talking in this class about how to get the most performance you can for a particular algorithms from a modern uh, CPU and, 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 and GPUs, right? So the question is sort of why are CPUs so fundamentally inefficient, right? So let's uh, look at, at this, right? So if you look at the... Uh, energy dissipated in executing an instruction, right, say uh, a multiply add, uh, where you'll, you'll see that most of the energy actually uh, does not go into performing the actual computation, right? So in this case, it's 6%, and the rest of the, the energy is spent dealing with the instruction and figuring out what the instruction is going to do. Uh, fetching the uh, and, and uh, dealing with the data, moving the data, and the overhead of controlling the circuitry and distributing the clock, which of course keeps everything synchro synchronous, right? So if you look at all of the uh, uh, things that one has to do to execute instruction, you've got to read the instruction, you've got to figure out what the instruction is going to do, you've got to check to see how the instruction is dependent on other instructions that are being executed, you've got to figure out whether the resource that you want to use to execute this instruction is available, uh, you've got to figure out where the operands are, you've got to fetch them from the register file, you've got to, you know, if this happens to be a load or a store, you may have to move data from caches, and then Way down here is the actual perform the arithmetic operation, and then you still have to you know, move the results, right? And so at the end of the day, you end up spending very little of the energy for a particular instruction. And so the question is sort of how can you make this situation better? So how does, how does SIMD make this, this, this uh, uh, pie chart look better? Yeah. You have uh, better risk of instructions to Right, right. So you amortize all of the parts that are not green over more green stuff, right? So you are executing across more uh, data elements, right? And the width of your SIMD is going to tell you how efficient potentially you can be, right? And so what will you know? So if 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 I can do eight data operations in one instruction, why don't I do 16 or 32 or 64? Yeah. Right, exactly, right? The, the, the wider you make it, you know, the, your peak is great, but your average is going to be a lot worse because you, ain't, you may not be able to fill up all of those SIMD uh, slots, right? And so... So this is the question, right, is that, hey, you can do better, and you might go to extremes, but, you know, ultimately you're not going to see uh, the, the data parallelism or the SIMD data parallelism that you need to keep all the uh, SIMD units busy. All right, so the question is sort of, you know, does SIMD make th improve things? Well, it does. So this is a, a study from a few years back uh, that was done at Stanford uh, that looked at, you know, uh, how much energy... Uh, gets consumed in a SIMD uh, uh, enabled uh, CPU for H.264 uh, video encoding, which is a pretty data parallel SIMD friendly uh, application. And you see that you know the the the, the components uh, of SIMD energy uh, shown by the, the the red boxes is not that high. So the question is, you know, if you want to do better, then you need to think about actually implementing more specialized uh, components, right? And so uh, what we want to look at is to look at some, some other types of, 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 of architecture. You see that the best, in this case, uh, for doing fast Fourier transform, which is the core 
of many signal processing uh, applications, right? And, and you know, it's, it's a really well-studied algorithm. Some people call it the most important algorithm uh, ever. Uh, and so you can think about implementing specialized hardware for that, and, and you can get a tremendous improvement in terms of the use of your silicon area and uh, the energy efficiency, right? So in this case, this is a fairly old study, 40 nanometers, which is, you know, ancient, right? Uh, uh, but what you see is that, uh, you know, the ASIC, which is this diamond, uh, you can see these diamonds then represent, uh, uh, the, in terms of, uh, uh, compared to a CPU, which is the uh, core, uh, core i7, so, so the CPU is, is the core i7, which is the, the lowest in terms of gigaflops per, per millimeter squared, and the star ASIC is, is, is the highest, right? So I have to reverse what I was saying a, a moment ago. And so the diamonds, which is the CPU, gives you the lowest energy efficiency and the lowest use of the, the chip area. And, you know, basically it's a factor of, of 1,000 in terms of the use of the chip area and a factor of 100 in terms of energy efficiency that you get with a CPU versus something that's very specialized for a particular uh, algorithm. So what's the downside of the ASIC approach? Yeah? You can only use it for that one algorithm and you have to design it, right? And so if you want to get your application going and you've got a new idea, are you going to wait 18 months to go design an ASIC? And then, uh, well, you, you, it better be a really important algorithm like FFT, you might, you know, so in order to, to kind of justify uh, ASIC implementations. Uh, but there are other ways of getting more efficiency than, than CPUs. Uh, one of the ideas that uh, uh, gets used extensively is this idea of digital signal processors. And it's the idea that, hey, you want to do a lot of processing of signals using DSP algorithms like FFT and, and, and filtering, uh, IR filtering, and it turns out that the instructions and the addressing modes in general purpose computers uh, can be improved upon, right? So that's what DSPs do. They're very complex instructions that do just what you want for specific algorithms. They have very uh, uh, you know, complex addressing modes that allow you to uh, you know, do the bit reversed addressing that you need for FFT, for example. Uh, now the question is, if I gave you this complex instruction set, could you write a compiler for it? And the answer is probably no. So you as the, you know, so, so along with the very complex uh, instructions that these uh, 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 DSPs have come with low level uh, programming that has to be done for implementing all these algorithms, right? But it's a hell of a lot easier than, you know, developing an ASIC, but it's, it's also uh, much more difficult than programming a general purpose CPU. So there are these trade-offs now between uh, efficiency and programmability that you get. Uh, another example of a specialized compute unit is uh, one that was developed by D.E. Shaw. So D.E. Shaw made a, mo a bunch of money in the financial uh, area and decided that he was going to spend some of that money doing uh, things for, for humanity. And one of the things he decided to do was uh, develop a uh, specialized accelerator for molecular dynamics, right? So if you want to understand how proteins fold, uh, you, you know, it comes down to figuring out the interaction between uh, uh, molecules, right? And so molecular dynamics... Uh, is, is, uh, is an important area in chemistry. You know, people have won Nobel Prizes for it and so on. Uh, and so they developed uh, this accelerator called Anton. And, uh, you know, by carefully uh, designing the algorithm with the hardware, they got tremendous uh, performance improvements over CPUs and GPUs, right? So you want to do an M-body simulation, given M-bodies, figure out the interaction between between them, and, and they've got specialized uh, hardware uh, for doing that. And they, you know, they've got, I think they've got three generations of, of Anton at this point, and uh, each one uh, uh, is better. And it, so the aside is, of course, 
There are ways of doing this with accelerators, but there are also ways of, of solving the problem statistically. And so there was this tension between the group of people who are doing accelerators and the group of people who are doing you know, uh, broad scale statistical approaches. Uh, these days, uh, uh, machine learning is all the rage, as you may have noticed, right? So uh, in fact, uh, your last programming assignment was uh, around machine learning. Uh, one of the accelerators that kicked off a lot of the, the interest uh, in developing new architectures for machine learning was the accelerator from Google called the Tensor Processing Unit. And the way to think about the Tensor Processing Unit is that uh, it made dense matrix multiply go very fast, right? And, uh, but dense matrix multiplies that are large, like 128, well, they start out at 256 by 256 uh, integer matrix multiplies, and then you know, future uh, uh, TPU versions had a, yeah, they went to 128 by 128, but then you were doing 16-bit uh, 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 floating point multiplies. Uh, but, uh, you know, lots of, you know, this is, this, this is uh, uh, a few years old in terms of the uh, citations, but lots of uh, uh, work in the architecture area to try and understand how to develop new specific architectures for the machine learning domain. So most of these uh, uh, architectures are, in fact, somewhat programmable because you need to adapt to uh, the, the, the changes in the uh, uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, but fundamentally, they are focused on doing the core uh, compute uh, kernel in, uh, in these ML uh, algorithms, which is matrix multiply. Right? Could be dense. Most of the, most of the cases, it's dense. But, but there are sparse uh, versions that are, that are interesting, too. Uh, all right, uh, so there's this issue of doing hardware that is fixed for a particular algorithm. And the question is, is there a middle ground that will allow you to develop hardware that is somewhat programmable, right? So this is the whole uh, 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 reason and motivation for... Uh, uh, hardware architectures that are called field programmable gate arrays, and some of you, of course, may have played uh, with, with these uh, uh, this sort of technology in in a, in a digital design class. And the key idea is that you've got a bunch of what are called uh, configurable logic blocks, which are basically uh, lookup tables for uh, Boolean algebra, right? So it will give you uh, a, a some uh, function of some number of inputs, in this case a four input uh, a Boolean function can be computed using the lookup table and then combined with a combinational block is a register which gives you storage, right? And so then you put these kinds of configurable logic blocks in an array and you connect them together and then uh, you can connect them into more complex uh, logic blocks. Uh, for instance, if you had a six input lookup table and you wanted to, for, to generate a 40 input uh, AND gate, you could cascade these uh, six input logic uh, blocks together uh, to create a more complex uh, function. Okay, so lookup table just basically just maps uh, a, a binary number to an output uh, and uh, allows you to compute functions of, of a different variety. So modern uh, FBJs combine the configurable logic blocks with more dedicated uh, uh, functions, such as dense memory and also multipliers, what are called DSP blocks, right? So the problem with constructing everything out of configurable logic blocks is it gives you the most flexibility, but it turns out there's a lot of overhead, right? There's a, the overhead in connecting these blocks together, and there's the overhead of actually implementing uh, the, the, the compute elements uh, using this uh, CLB source of technology. And so if you want to have a more dense, more efficient use of the silicon area, then you come, then you want these uh, hard uh, macro blocks uh, for memory and for 
uh, for, for uh, multiplication, right? And uh, so you can buy, combine these together, and then, uh, you know, if you actually want to use them, you could, you know, uh, come visit my lab. I could show you, you know, uh, how to uh, access them. Or you could go to uh, Amazon EC2, and, and they also provide uh, FPGA resources, right? And so they've got some quite uh, advanced FPGA capabilities that you can access uh, uh, using uh, cloud services. And then these have both, of course, uh, links to memory DDR4. Uh, we haven't said a lot about memory, but, but uh, maybe if we have time at the end of this lecture, we can talk about uh, uh, the different kinds of memory technologies, uh, interfaces to the CPUs through PCIe, and links to other FPGAs. Uh, and uh, then they have a whole environment uh, that allows you to do uh, the uh, uh, software development in order to actually program these FPGAs. So you're looking across the spectrum here from uh, easiest to program general purpose CPU to ASIC, right? We see this trade-off between energy efficiency and programmability, right? across the space of uh, computing technologies that, that you could apply. And, you know, as a system designer, you need to you know, pick the right one, right? Which is sort of, you know, what are the constraints that you have in terms of the energy efficiency you need and how quickly you need to get your application or how much effort you're willing to, to, to spend to get your application working, right? So you can imagine that, you know, if you can get the performance you need with a CPU, hey, just go do it, right? I mean, and, and program your application uh, using a high-level uh, uh, language. Uh, if you need more performance, right, then you keep going to the right. Uh, GPUs, you may have to write some CUDA. DSP, you might have to do assembly language programming. Uh, Domain-specific compute, well, this might work quite well if your domain is something that might like machine learning and you can program this uh, accelerator using a framework like PyTorch or, or, or TensorFlow. That might work. If you have to do an FPJ, then you basically have to become a hardware designer and, uh, and ASIC is, uh, yeah, definitely you're a hardware designer, right? So, you know, as you move to the right, you get more energy efficiency, you know, dramatically more energy efficient if you do an ASIC, but then you have to work much harder and you've got to spend a lot more money, right, in order to, uh, uh, to move to, to the right, especially if you move all the way to the right. Okay, any questions so far on sort of the, the space of, uh, you know, trade-offs between uh, uh, energy efficiency and programmability, the different... Uh, points in the space. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously if we're talking about basics, it's like a thousand years ago. It's, it's much better. But in the middle there, it's kind of, um, like, you just think about, like, okay, you can get the TPU, but yeah. why not just get, like, two GPUs and, and why bother? Like, it, it's probably way less expensive to get well, I mean, I think, you know, the jury is, is out, right, between sort of whether, I mean, it, it, clearly the GPU is, it, it is, is taking pages out of the TPU, right? It said, okay, it was this general purpose thread thing, oh, but hold, let's put these tensor core units in, in and make it more specialized. But now, you as a CUDA programmer try to program those tensor core units. I mean, we didn't do that in this class, but it's actually pretty challenging, right? So, you know. The, 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 the space is in flux and it's driven by, you know, the, this really high value application called machine learning, right? So everybody's kind of, you know, uh, tilting their architecture to exploit that. Yeah. Yeah. Why is the program for the DSP uh, higher than the GPUs? Because, like, the DSP can use a GPU, like, more machine, like, on average? Well, I mean, it, 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 it tends to be more focused on, on DSP. And uh, it's got, uh, got a, a lot of specialized uh, addressing mechanisms and, and, and compute for that. So given that you're trying to do digital signal processing, it's going to be more efficient. But if you're trying to do machine learning, probably not. Yeah. All right. So now let's you know, 
kind of look at sort of what it would take to move to the right a little bit more, right? So, so we, we spent a lot of time in this class thinking about how we program the fixed set of resources that we provide you in a existing architecture, uh, such as a general purpose processor or a, uh, or a GPU. But now let's think a little bit about what it would take to either specify or, 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 or program a accelerator where you get to specify uh, a bunch of things that you don't get to control if you're thinking about a general purpose uh, environment. In particular, you get to uh, have some custom memory system, right? A lot of the performance improvement you can get in, in any particular uh, piece of hardware has to do with, with how you organize the, the memory to exploit the particular characteristics of locality and an access uh, behavior that you see in your application. And you get uh, specialized uh, compute that matches uh, what, what you need in your application, right? So the question is sort of, you know, how do we think about or how do we program, uh, you know, specialized uh, processes or accelerators, right? So traditionally, you know, uh, you had to become a hardware designer and think about things that at the level of what's called uh, the register transfer level or, or the hardware description level, level right? So you, you had to write in, in languages like VHDL or Verilog. How many people have, have written Verilog? Oh, good fair number of you, a uh, good fair number of you. So you understand the pain involved in programming at the Verilog level, right? Now, recently there has been this idea called high-level synthesis, and the approach is, hey, I'm going to write a C program and then I'm going to have some smart compiler convert that in, into hardware. There are two things wrong with this idea. One is that C programs were not intended to be descriptions of hardware, right? So you have to make all kinds of inferences about what the hardware should be doing because the C program was designed for a general purpose processor. It was not designed for hardware. So that's the, the first problem. The second problem is that in order to kind of get around the deficiencies of C, they put in these pragmas, right? And so you get to direct the compiler to do certain things. Well, the problem is putting in all these pragmas, you essentially have to know a lot about hardware to put in the pragmas in the right way. And so you've kind of defeated the whole purpose of kind of rising up uh, to, uh, to, to the level of C, high, uh, high C and then, in fact, in order to get anything that, that's worthwhile and performs well, you've got to kind of descend down to the level of hardware by using these, these pragmas. Okay. So today, uh, instead of kind of looking at high-level synthesis, what we want to look at is a language that we call spatial, which is a high-level language for designing hardware accelerators uh, that, that's uh, uh, designed to enable performance-oriented programmers to specify hardware. So everybody in this class at this point is a performance-oriented programmer, right? That's what you've been doing all quarter, and so you guys qualify. And so the key thing that performance-oriented programmers like to think about is parallelism, right? And locality. This is what we've been dealing with uh, uh, in the whole quarter, right? And uh, in terms of locality, we want to think maybe about some specialized memories and how you do the data movement. So his spatial, so the quick uh, one slide description of spatial is it's uh, designed for, uh, uh, it's a, it's, it's a domo domain specific language for accelerator design. And it has constructs to express parallel patterns, which you're also pretty familiar with, right? So data parallel patterns over, sorry, data parallel patterns uh, um, over collections. So map, zip, reduce, these are all uh, concepts that you're, you're familiar with. And what we want to do is we want to think about how to execute these parallel patterns using two types of parallelism. One that you're very familiar with, which is independent parallelism, right? So thinking about taking a map and running the, the map uh, with independent computation units. And the other is dependent parallelism which I think some of you are quite familiar with too, right? Dependent parallelism is where you've got parallel units that are dependent on each other. So how would you execute dependent parallel units uh, 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 
those of you who how do you execute things how do you execute a set of uh, a, a computation in which the components of the computation are in fact dependent yeah you do some sort of like dynamic study like maybe like a Maybe it's a concept we haven't talked about explicitly here. So, so it's not something that you, unless you, you, you've heard about it in some other context, maybe a hardware design co context, yeah? Would you like do kind of what you do with the CPU instruction pipeline? Exactly. Like, um, right, right. So the different components of an instruction execution pipeline are all dependent. But you've got a bunch of independent instructions, and you execute them the same way you would if you were doing in a factory and you were working on a car. You create an assembly line, and each of the stations do things independently, and then you get parallelism across the different uh, sections of the pipeline. So pipelining is the other way of, of, of doing parallelism, where you've got dependencies, right? So we want to look at how to do uh, pipeline parallelism. Uh, parallel patterns can be nested, so you can get hierarchical control. Uh, we said that one of the key mechanisms that uh, a hardware designer or, a, uh, uh, or somebody who wants to control uh, the uh, locality or exploit locality in the application is to be able to uh, explicitly specify the memory hierarchy and how that gets used. Uh, there's also this notion of being able to look at the whole design space using parameters. And you be able, want to expose these to the compiler uh, and allow the compiler to potentially uh, explore the design space for you. So the, the key here is that let's focus on what is interesting and important in terms of getting high performance, which, as we said repeatedly, is about how you exploit parallelism, both independent parallelism and dependent parallelism, and how you uh, manage and, uh, and figure out uh, the, the locality, right? And I would claim that it's kind of more intuitive than thinking about things from a thread level for these kinds of applications that uh, you might see in a, a machine learning uh, context. All right, so let's talk about uh, the spatial language and let's start with the memory templates, right? So as I said, you have this explicit memory hierarchy. So you get to specify what memory is on chip. Ah, my pen's back. Uh, and what memory is, is, is off chip. So, so you might have SRAM on chip, and you might have a data type, right? In this case, uh, unsigned in 8. And a, uh, uh, in this case, it's an array. So you want, might specify. Uh, how many elements. And then you can also specify uh, DRAM. All right, in this case, again, it's 8-bit uh, uh, value. And this is a two-dimensional array. So you have, in this case, image and buffer. And then, of course, you've got registers. You've got a variety of, of different kinds of registers. Uh, you've got uh, accumulators. Uh, you've got FIFOs, which are just queues, so we'll say a lot about using FIFOs. Uh, you might, if you're doing uh, image processing, have the idea of a line buffer, which is this two-dimensional uh, array that can be shifted uh, by, by lines. And then you might have a shift register, which is uh, similar uh, in spirit to the line buffer. All right, so when we're de dealing with CPU, you, you, there's only only the, 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 the main address space, the address space of memory, that is uh, visible to the programmer, right? And then you, as the programmer, uh, can write code that is cache-friendly, but you don't control how data moves between the main memory and the cache, right? That's handled automatically by the underlying hardware controller. In spatial, that's not the case. You, the programmer, have to explicitly move data back and forth between the different levels of the memory hierarchy. And in this case, you're moving data from the DRAM, from the image, to the buffer, right? With a load operation, right? 
Okay, so, the, so this is a dense data movement. The next is a gather, right? So we've talked about gather, so can someone tell me how gather works here? Right, so you're saying that you're going to get it from image, and in this case, 10 elements, and the addresses or the locations are going to be specified in some array A, right? And then you're going to, so essentially, you are taking sparse data and making it dense uh, in buffer, right? So, so you can imagine there's load and gather, and then there's store and scatter, right? Okay, and then you can also create streams, uh, and you can stream data in and out. And streaming will be a key component of uh, getting efficiency. All right, what about control templates? Well, the idea is that, oh, by the way, uh, the spatial language is embedded in a, in a language called Scala. Uh, for historical reasons, we won't get into it, but Scala is actually a very nice language to embed DSLs into it because it's very flexible. Uh, we've actually seen Scala for, for, when we were talk, talking about Spark, right? So, so you have, uh, in fact, seen it before. And so uh, it was very popular at one time as, as embedding languages uh, go, but it has certain deficiencies around the, the use of the JVM, which kind of limited its uh, wide uh, uh, use, widespread use. Okay, so... Uh, so you've got these Excel blocks, right, which are going to divide your program into parts that are accelerated and parts that just run on the CPU. Uh, and the question is whether you run the Excel block once or whether you run it continuously, which is the Excel star syntax. And then there's this idea of finite state machines, which we are not going to focus on at all. What we will focus on is the key mechanisms for doing parallel patterns, which is for each, which is essentially a map, and then reduce, which is a reduce, right? And this says, you know, for, you know, all the elements in C, and you're going to step through it by, by one, do the following uh, uh, code, uh, which is the block, uh, the, the block of the, of the for loop, the uh, core of the for, for loop, as specified uh, within the braces. Okay. So there are a bunch of design para uh, parameters that you can specify. You can, you can specify how much particular uh, for each and, and reduces are parallelized. You can specify how they get scheduled you can say that you want this to be pipelined or you want it to be streamed. And we'll say a little bit about uh, each of these in just a moment. You can specify parameters such as you want the size of the buffer to be uh, a range, you know, the default to be 64, but you want, might want the range to be 64 to 1,024. Uh, and, uh, and that can be explored then potentially by the compiler. All right, so if you specify things that require uh, the use of memory banking, the compiler will handle it for you, right? So if you parallelize something, and the <coughs> parallelization implies that you have multiple accesses uh, to a particular memory unit, then it's the responsibility of the compiler to make sure that you can actually achieve that parallelization factor by duplicating memories or figuring out how to bank the memories appropriately. Uh, so, but that's a detail that, that uh, you don't have to consider. So that's something that the compiler deals for you. All right, so let's look at an example to bring uh, the, these concepts home, right? So we're going to do inner product, uh, your favorite uh, little uh, kernel. And we want to build an accelerator in spatial, right? And so we're going to have these three. We're going to have the code here. We have the sketch of the generated hardware. Uh, below, and uh, let's see what happens. So let's start with the C code, right, just to make sure everybody's uh, clear. So we're going to malloc two vectors, vec1 and vec2, 
and then we are going to uh, compute the uh, inner pr product uh, using this simple for loop, right? We multiply each of the elements and we add them all together. Okay, that's clear, right? So that's what you would do if you're writing for a C code, right? So what, what are you going to do if you want to build an accelerator for this, right? Well, so you, and remember, you now have to control all the memory. So let's assume that VEC1 and VEC2 are integer arrays in DRAM, right? And so it's clear here by this specification of DRAM that these two arrays are going to live in DRAM, right? Now, we haven't said exactly how DRAM works, but let's assume that we have a way of moving data between uh, the DRAM and the accelerator using direct memory access, right? Which is an efficient way of moving data between uh, the main memory and the accelerator, right? And so uh, we have an Excel block, right? Which is where we are going to uh, do the uh, acceleration. And All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we need to uh, move data uh, from the DRAM into the accelerator, and we need a place for that data to land, right? So we have to define some, da some data structure within the accelerator for that, and we're going to create two SRAM blocks for this purpose, right? Tile 1 and Tile 2. And these are going to have size tile size. And uh, they are going to be in SRAM, right? And, you know, there's a question of sort of how, how large they should be, but let's uh, talk about that in just a moment. So then the first thing we need to do is we need to think about, because we, we are going to do these things by tiling, we need a doubly nested loop, right? Single nest won't work because we're going to compute our inner product using by tiles, right? So why would we want to fetch a tile of data from DRAM instead of single elements? Yeah. You're going to get much better use of the interface between the DRAM and the accelerator, right? It's like going to the grocery store. You never just pick up one thing. That would be really wasteful. You take the effort to go all the way to the grocery store, you get a whole bunch of things and bring them and put them uh, in, your, in your fridge or your pantry, right, so that, that you don't have to go back to the grocery store every time you want to uh, uh, eat something, right? So uh, same idea here. It's costly to go to DRAM. You want to get more than one thing. You might want to get a whole tile size. Uh, 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 amount of, of data, and, and so uh, you need to have a place in your memory uh, to hold that, right? So, of course, if this was a CPU, this might just be general purpose cache, right? And the movement of data would be controlled by the caching algorithms. Here, you get to explicitly move the data and program the data movement. All right, so, so the first thing now we do is, is we're going to have uh, a, a, uh, a reduction over tile size because size, at the end of the day uh, we need to reduce the elements uh, using addition in order to, to generate the, uh, the output, right? And uh, so, in, so first of all we're going to load the two vectors, right? Lo load a tile size element of data from VEC1 into tile 1, and a tile size element of, of uh, vector 2 into tile 2, right? Then we are going to reduce within the tile, right, in step 2, and then reduce across the tiles in step 3, okay? So now we've got the kind of this three-step process where we load a tile, we do the intratile accumulate, and then we do the accumulate across the tiles. Okay, so now the question is, I want to improve the performance of my hardware, and for that I'm going to you know, need to uh, exploit parallelism. So where is the parallelism in this algorithm? 
Yeah. Uh, it's like in the, you can do multiple, you can do steps one, two, and three, like at the same time for different parts of the data. Okay, so that would be an example of pipelining, right? So you could pipeline that. So that, that's one uh, place that we could exploit uh, parallelism in, in, in this, uh, uh, in a product representation. Where else? Yeah. You can reduce across multiple tiles at once. So within each tile, Okay, so, so you're saying, uh, so w within each tile we can do what? So this interlocks produce can occur across multiple tiles at once. Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. The innermost reduce is, is, is only within a tile. Yes. I'm saying you can do that several times at once. Yeah, right. So you want to parallelize step two. Okay. Yeah, so we can parallelize step two. How, what, what might be the best way to parallelize step two, given what you know? What would be the most efficient way of parallelizing step two? Pull something out of your pocket that you are very familiar with. <laughs> yeah. It, it seems like you're always doing the same instructions. So SIMD. SIMD. SIMD would be a good way of parallelizing step two, since we're doing the same operation to all of the the elements in in the in the tile, right? Uh, and, and that is, uh, so we are doing this multiplication and reduction, right? So if you want to think about this reduce, what, if you want to parallelize this reduce, what do you do? You're going to need some sort of parallel multiply followed by a reduction tree, right? Okay, so... Uh, Spatial allows you to do that. It's got this notion of reduction, right? It's got this notion of reduction trees. And so you can parallelize by two in this case. You know, there's not much of a tree, but you're doing two, two multiplies, but you can, you can go wider, right? Go as wide as you want. And what would be the, down, the downside of going wider? Reduction tree is larger. What else is larger? What? The hardware, right? You get you use more resources, right? You you you, you get to control, right? You you say, hey, I want more parallelism. You know, there's not there's no free lunch here, right? You're going to use more resources, but you get to control how many resources you use based on how much performance improvement you want. Uh, okay, so that's uh, let, let's hold this idea of pipelining for just a second. Uh, but you you could also control the tile size such that you could uh, decide how much data you want to fetch uh, every time you go to memory and optimize that. So you could specify what tile size you want to use. And lastly, uh, this idea of you could say, hey, instead of running the, the uh, outer reduce uh, one step at a time, let's overlap them by specifying a pipeline schedule, right? So pipelining here would say, now I want to overlap. Now, what is the key thing that you need for pipelining to work? And it's kind of shown in this picture here, and maybe uh, you could read, but... Yeah, but, but we know there are no hazards, right? Because, okay. But what re extra resources do we need? Yeah. It is just we need to the storage. Yeah, we need we need to be able to we need some double buffering, right? So while stage one is working on some filling uh, data from memory, right? Stage two has to be able to work on data that uh, has been generated from the previous execution of stage one, right? So you essentially need some sort of double buffering. Uh, and so that, that's extra. So pipelining is as close to a free lunch as you might get in hardware, but it's not completely free because you add memory, right? So you decide the pipeline and it's, you get, you know, in this case, best case would be you pipeline to a depth of three and you get a 3x improvement in performance. 
That's, of course, not uh, always uh, true, but uh, the overhead to doing that would be the extra uh, tile memory that you need uh, at every uh, stage interface in order to make sure that uh, uh, data doesn't get overwritten uh, while you're doing the pipelining. Does everybody follow that? Good. So, you, so we saw kind of three th types of optimization, parallelization, uh, how we deal with the, the data locality, and pipelining. Okay? So just to make sure that you uh, all understand then, so spatial programmer's responsibility, what as a spatial programmer are you responsible for? Yeah? What you're actually doing. Yeah? Can you be a little more specific about what you're actually doing? Basically, how, how you want to make you know, like some operator, how you want to compose that into the different types of hardware. Like, right, so you've got to be able to express your, 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 your algorithm uh, in using the uh, for each and, and reduce constructs. Uh, what else are you responsible for? Yeah. Handling memory, the explicit memory hierarchy, figuring out what, where the data should live uh, in the different uh, uh, memories that you define. What else? Specifying parallelism. Specifying, specifying parallelism, how much and, and where. Uh, I think that's about it, right? Specifying the algorithm, specifying the memory hierarchy, doing explicit data movement, and then picking the tiling factors, parallelism, and scheduling, right? And then the compiler's uh, responsibility is this banking and buffering of memories to maximize uh, the performance and, and minimize resources, and some lower-level things about generating uh, configurations for explicit uh, targets. And, of course, if you want to improve performance and understand performance, you need some way of getting feedback about the performance that your particular uh, code uh, can achieve on any one of these targets, and then what sort of resources they might use. Okay, so, uh, you know, spatial is being used to convert TensorFlow uh, uh, representations of machine learning algorithms into hardware. Uh, I think uh, more interesting might be, you know, something that you're very familiar with, which is sort of how to optimize an algorithm like flash att or like attention. Okay, so this is uh, something that you've uh, uh, just been thinking about. So we talked about fused attention, right? And so what was the big benefit of fused attention? Yeah. You don't have to materialize the field attention, <coughs> you don't have to, uh, the field attention matrix. You, you kind of tile things into blocks, and then you uh, compute a, a, a block at a time, and then you also get this idea of fusing the different uh, components of the attention algorithm together uh, and, uh, and minimizing memory bandwidth uh, by doing that. And then also uh, you, uh, uh, you minimize memory bandwidth and that, that, that gives you the, the benefit, right? And uh, so you, you <clears throat> get this performance and memory uh, size benefits. Uh, so it turns out that if you kind of write things using this spatial uh, 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 program streaming uh, programming model, you can get a lot of these benefits with, with a simpler programming model, right? So that you, a model where you don't have to write an explicit fused kernel. So let's see how that works, right? So uh, let's kind of go back to the time before flash attention, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, before flash attention, right, you had this kernel-based execution model. And... Uh, and the flash attention, you know, as we said, prevents the materialization of the full matrix. Uh, with the streaming execution model, you also get these benefits, but you didn't have to write the flash attention uh, 
uh, um, kernel, and in particular, you didn't have to pay extra computation, right? So it turns out that to deal with the, uh, uh, the softmax, you had to do extra computation in order to uh, deal with the fact that you had this, this row uh, computation that uh, you needed the whole row in order to compute the softmax. And it turns out that, that with streaming, uh, you can get away from doing this at the cost of having uh, potentially a little bit more memory. All right, so let's see how that works, right? So if we think about softmax, right, as you know, it's actually uh, a three-step procedure, right? So first of all, you've got to compute the exponential uh, for the particular uh, value of uh, Sij, and then uh, you have to uh, do the row-wise row uh, reduction, and then you have to do the division of the exponential by the row-wise uh, information, right? And so this three-step process uh, is shown here pictorially, right? So first the exponential, then the reduction, uh, which is uh, row-wise, and then the division. So if you do this without uh, the optimization of flash attention, right, then you have this materialization of the whole matrix. And, uh, of course, that increases your memory footprint and uh, increases your, your memory bandwidth. And so this kind of shows you the overview. It shows all the data that has to be both materialized and, and moved between uh, the accelerator, which you can think is happening uh, up top, and the, the uh, GPU memory, which is happening, uh, which is below, right? And so all the data that crosses this line, then, is memory bandwidth that has to be uh, used in order to compute uh, the, uh, the attention, right? So with the streaming execution model, you can avoid the materialization of the matrix. So let's show you how that works, how, how the streaming works, right? So essentially, you know, in this example, we're going to compute the exponential, uh, and then we are going to compute the row sum. Right by reducing uh, the row, and so the way that you would write this in spatial, right, uh, is that you're gonna have the first for each, which is kind of a map, uh, do the comp computation of the exponential, right? A but then instead of putting the output into another matrix, we're just going to enqueue the output in a FIFO. Right, And so the semantics of spatial are this for each and this for each are executing at the same time. Right? So now you can think of, 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 of the first for each as being the producer and the second for each is, is, is consuming the uh, output of the uh, producer. And so, you know, essentially the, the, the reduction then uh, happens by dequeuing an element from the first uh, uh, for each and, and uh, keeping the, having this continuous sum. And then finally, when you're, you're done, uh, you, uh, you, you generate the output also in a FIFO. Right? So there's a single element. So does everybody follow how this works? Right? You essentially have these two for reaches, and they're operating in a pipeline. Right? And between the pipeline are a FIFO. Right? So, so initially what happens is we uh, define the on-chip memory for S, and we define the two FIFOs. 
we uh, do the NQ, we compute uh, the exponential element here, and then we do NQ the, 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 uh, the data on the FIFO. We DQ the FIFO in, in the second um, for each, right? And so this is, just shows uh, how things work with streaming, right? So before streaming, you would materialize the whole of the n by n matrix. With streaming, data just moves through, in this case, the two element FIFO. So this is the equivalent of the double buffering that we showed in the first example. But here, you've got an explicit FIFO. And so uh, because you have, have uh, figured out uh, that that's, that's all you need, you get a tremendous reduction in the amount of memory you need. But in order for this to work, your programming model has to think about these two kernels operating at the same time being connected with a FIFO, which is a very natural hardware way to think about things. But it's not a natural software way to think about things, right? So <clears throat> Spatial kind of allows you to think about this idea of pipeline parallelism uh, in, in ways that you know, match what you would want to do in an efficient hardware implementation, which don't match what you uh, typically would do with software. So back to the original uh, kernel, uh, kernel by kernel uh, scheme in which you are materializing all the memory. You've got all this memory that gets materialized. You've got all this data movement that's happening, uh, which we showed was unnecessary. And that if you do, with, if you do things with streaming, then thing, the data can just move through FIFOs between the different kernels. Uh, because one kernel puts data in a FIFO, the next kernel picks it up and does the compute. And you never have to materialize the whole matrix. And in cases where you need uh, data, uh, for instance, for doing the row operation, then you've got to be able to accumulate a whole row of data in your FIFO. And so the limit is that you need to be able to have this FIFO be the length of a row of the matrix, right? OK, now that could potentially become a limit. And you can go through the details. And the details uh, uh, will uh, be clear, right? And so the question is, so you, you need a, oh, this is just showing that you, you need a, you need a row of, of, of data in order to compute uh, the P matrix, or, or so an element of the P matrix. And you can look at, at uh, the Alicia. And so the question is, you know, could we do better with flash attention? And the answer is yes, right? So th there's still room for optimizations like flash attention, because maybe at some point, if your matrix uh, size, your, your sequence length gets really long, then even a row of data is too much, right? And so uh, if you want to, you know, limit the size of your FIFO, uh, you, can, uh, you, can, you can apply flash attention to uh, this sort of optimize, uh, to, to a, a, a streaming-based uh, optimization, okay? Flash attention you know, reorders the operations and uses a running sum and rescaling instead of naive reduction in order to uh, do this computation. And now we can dramatically uh, reduce the need for this uh, row uh, amount of data in our FIFO. Right? All right, so if you would kind of sort of compare uh, streaming uh, versus uh, kernel by kernel, uh, so what you get uh, with, uh, uh, with with a streaming implementation is uh, is uh, you know you get this idea, idea that you can exploit more parallelism, right? Because you have this ability to overlap the computation of the kernels uh, between each other uh, using this pipeline type of uh, execution, you get more to the ability to exploit more parallelism. And uh, you can uh, spatially map each computation 
without with pipeline communication, right? And so this is what you get with the streaming execution model. And then you can overlap and, and pipeline the computation for different output tiles, right? So you get that extra dimension of parallelism and performance with a streaming implementation. The other benefit that you potentially get with a streaming implementation is that you don't have to explicitly create a fused kernel, right? So uh, you can imagine that these kernels are implemented individually, and you can either use the capability of the compiler to do this double buffering technique, but then if you want even further optimization, then you can replace the double buffer with a FIFO-like uh, uh, programming uh, uh, expression, as I just showed you in this, this, this example, and get even more efficiency. Uh, and that's easier than creating this you know, explicitly fused kernel as you would have to do uh, with a traditional uh, uh, programming model, right? So the streaming execution model gives you this extra degree of freedom. You know, operations get fused automatically if you write things using FIFOs, or they get, you know, even if you write them using buffers, the double buffering uh, uh, technique can be employed, right? And then the compiler can automatically generate the fused execution. Okay. So any questions here? Yeah. So just to confirm, the streaming ex execution model is independent from the notion of accelerator design. Like, uh, like you can write a streaming program, but it can run on like pre-existing. Yeah, it can. It can. I mean, you can imagine it running on a existing architecture. And the question is sort of whether. So, so it's very difficult in CUDA to write a streaming program, right? I mean, you fundamentally don't have the ability to have different parts of the kernel operating independently in, in, in ways. And so what you typically would write is you would write some sort of fused kernel, right? And so you, need, you, you, you can imagine that, uh, I think, you know, if you talk to, to the people developing CUDA, they're trying to enable this kind of execution. Uh, but uh, I don't know how to do it yet. You know, I'm not saying it'll never be possible, but it's not, not possible today. Yeah? In the streaming execution model, what if the FIFO diff is getting too large? Then is there an alternative to get the streaming without the FIFO? Yeah, so, so, so then you might, you, you could use buffering, right? You could just use, use SRAM as, instead of registers. And you might have to write your, your, your application slightly differently. Or you would try to think about you know, using techniques that fundamentally reduce the, the FIFO size, like flash attention, right? So you know, sort of you can get it in, in, in a sort of brain dead way just by using a FIFO, and you don't have to work too hard. But then eventually maybe the FIFO gets too big, and then you have to, have to work harder and, and, and do something that actually transforms the application. Yeah. So just to like, kind of clarify, um, like the examples you gave were using spatial. Yeah. But spatial is like kind of give you like an FPG or an ASIC that you take on, right? It's not. No, we, 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 you could target all sorts of things. Oh, you could target. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, uh, well, it, was, it was intended as a hardware model. Uh, it, it, it uh, Works very well for a new style of architecture that we've defined called reconfigurable data flow. It doesn't really match GPUs. You could, of course, make it run on CPUs. Uh, but, yeah. Other questions? But, but the, the whole point I want you to get is this idea of the streaming execution model, this idea of, of having kernels that operate at the, in parallel at the same time in a pipeline execution mode, and the notion that you can get the benefit of fusing and tiling without it being explicit. Okay, um, Okay. so the accelerated uh, summary is the significant energy efficiency improvements from acceleration, right? So you can get, you know, 100 uh, to 1,000 X improvement. Uh, designing accelerators is all about understanding your application which is something that we've been focusing on the whole uh, of this course. 
and then figuring out how to exploit you know, the specific uh, parallelism and locality uh, that is, is exhibited by your application, right? And we, we kind of have seen that. And, but, but now, in the context of accelerated design, you get to define explicitly what resources are going to uh, be used to exploit uh, parallelism and then how uh, the memory hierarchy is going to be designed to make sure that you can uh, get maximum locality, right? And so you get to define the sizes, you get to define when the data moves from one uh, part of the memory hierarchy to another part of the memory hierarchy. Okay? So you need insight into the application. Where's the bottleneck? Is it memory bound? Is it compute bound? How does that change as I change my algorithm or as I change my implementation? And then spatial is kind of a way of, of programming model and a way of thinking about how to, to explore the design space uh, when you want to make these sorts of trade-offs, right? So it's kind of a, you know, a small step beyond what you've been doing here in that you, you, know, you, uh, you, you now understand the application, you understand parallelism, you understand the different types of parallelism. Well, well now, what, what would you do if you actually had control over the hardware that you get to define? And then you think about uh, what, uh, what that means. Okay, uh, so uh, we don't have time to talk about... Uh, uh, the design of memory, maybe uh, Kayvon will talk about it uh, on Thursday, maybe not. It's uh, up to him. But uh, as far as uh, sort of acceleration and heterogeneous compute, uh, we're, we're done with that. All right. Thanks.